There's some video cameras back there. Are, are you guys videotaping this? Does that mean that I can't pace back and forth like I usually do? All right. <laughs> you know, I usually have to <clears throat> I usually have to actually be there before I can figure out what I'm going to talk about. I have to kind of smell the room. And and last night in a taxi, um, I kind of got the impression that 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 the demographics of this conference are are kind of younger than a lot of other conferences. So um, that people, these kids in the taxi were asking me all kinds of outlandish questions about the history of PGP. They were urban myths about it. And so I realized that <coughs> all these stories that I've told over the years, that, that a lot of people here haven't heard them because they were like watching Saturday morning cartoons during this. <laughs> so maybe I could tell some of those stories again. Um, <clears throat> so this is not really a technical presentation. It's going to be more like uh, telling you PGP war stories. Um, although I, you know, I can certainly answer technical questions. Um, the, the, the question I get asked the most is, are there any back doors in PGP? Now, how many people here were going to ask that question? Yeah? How many people here believe in black helicopters? Yeah. The same hands, you see. <laughs> um, no, there's no back doors in PGP. There never have been any back doors in any version of PGP that I've been connected with. You look puzzled. Uh, yes, sir, because um, okay, the reference for this is a spy school on FTV, two days ago in the need to know segment. Um, they said that the government or the NSA or whatever does have a back door in the latest version of PGP, which I believe is version 6. However, uh, however, version 5 does not. First of all, the latest version is version 8.0.2. Okay. Secondly, do you think that if there was a backdoor in tech, that Tech TV would, you know, that somebody at NSA would tell Tech TV, you know? <laughs> you know, the kind of, the, the questions that I get like this, it, it sort of reminds me of Comic Book Man in The Simpsons, you know? You know? <laughs> you know, these are people that believe that uh, The X-Files is a documentary. You know? No, there is no back door in PGP. Get a life. Come on. <laughs> you know, I get email from people that say, that, you know, here's, here's email that appears on my in basket, right? And it says, I've heard that there's a back door in PGP. Is this true? You can tell me. You know? <laughs> and, and so I have to actually sit on my hands to restrain myself from the end, you know, because you know how email is, there's this kind of impulsive nature of email that this is, this is actually what causes flame wars, you know. It's the psychology of email. There's that kind of itchy trigger finger video game response in email that you don't get back in the old days when we used to write letters by hand uh, or even by typewriter. You know, there's, there's the, the urge to say something right now, and I, had to I always have to fight that urge when I get letters like that. <coughs> um, you know, um, I mean, th th to answer the question at so many levels, I usually don't a try this question this early in the talk. You know, usually that comes later because I try to talk about something more important. You know, but but I'll but I want to do it now because this is DEF CON and, and there's a lot of you know comic book men you know <laughs> in the audience. Um, um, you know, you, you know, in, in World War II, um, the, the, when the Allies could break the Enigma machine, uh, they, there was that story about Coventry, you know, the, the town in, in Britain that was going to be bombed. <coughs> but, and the Brits knew it but because they broke the Enigma code, but they, couldn't, they didn't want to evacuate the city because, because then the Germans would know that they could break the code. So they kept it a secret and they let it be bombed. Well, you know, that's what happens when they can break it, right? So they're not going to tell Tech TV, you know. 
They're not going to tell their brother-in-law, you know, who's going to, you know, tell it at some, in some rumor mill at, you know, at some black t-shirt conference. You know, that's just not going to happen, right? So that's one level I'd like to answer. But, but that's really not even the right level to answer it. The right level to answer it is, <coughs> it's impossible to put a backdoor on PGP because, because all the engineers who work on it work on it because they believe the same things that I believe. You know, they believe in, in privacy and civil liberties. You know, the reason why they signed up to work there is because of that. And they're not going to, you know, they would notice in the CVS logs that there's, you know, that somebody's putting back doors in it. Uh, it's so, there's too many people involved. It couldn't be kept a secret. You know, conspiracies can't get that big. You know, if I wanted to put a back door in PGP, I, don't, I have no clue how I would do it, you know? <laughs> um, so there's never been a back door in any version of PGP in the entire 12 years since 1991. And I certainly wouldn't stand by and allow anybody to put one in. Uh, not after everything I've been through, you know? I mean, you become invested in, you know, you put so much of yourself in investing in, um, fighting the good fight and you know you're not going to stand by and allow somebody like network associates for example everybody thought oh network associates is going to put a back door in network associates wouldn't have a clue how to put a back door in pgp <laughs> <coughs> they wouldn't know how to put a front door in pgp <laughs> the great relief that we have is that pgp has been rescued from network associates about a year ago and uh and so there was a lot of dancing in the streets. Uh, PGP is back, you know. We're, you know, the, it's out of the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. It's now, you know. <laughs> you had a question. Yeah. Um, how often do you actually do audits in the database to verify that, say, you're being compromised on somebody else's computer? Didn't display previous CDS today? The engineers that are working on the code are, you know, they're close to the code. They're, you know, they're focused on the code. Um, you know, they're not, nobody could change their code without them knowing it. it there's just too many redundant eyes on it. Um, you know, you're not going to have somebody break in in the middle of the night and, and put a back door in and, because it just, it, it wouldn't work. It's just, it's not how things work in the real world. There's no, uh, you know, there's no, uh, uh, what is it, the, the, the uh, what, what, what's the name of that uh, cons vast conspiracy that the New World Order was supposed to come from, the uh, what, something commission? The Trilateral Commission, yeah. Sometimes I get email asking about the Trilateral Commission. For some reason, everybody who who is really paranoid about that seems to be attracted to cryptography, you know, and, and they all write to me asking about this. Um, you know, and I have to tell you that I can't review the code like I used to. When I was, you know, back in the old days, I used to read every line of code. And then as it got bigger and bigger, then I used to just do things like read the random number generator, you know, and, and the key spots where, you know, where it was most sensitive. But it's just too big, you know. I, I can't read all the GUI code and C++ classes and all that stuff. I just can't. Um, so I can't realistically do that, and, and it's, it's very hard to do, you know. We publish the source code and hope that people will look at it. Um, you know, and sometimes people find bugs. There, are, there have been bugs. There have been, there have been some embarrassing bugs in PGP. Um, not as many as you find in other products, like Microsoft Windows or something like that, you know? <laughs> especially security-related bugs. It seems like every couple of weeks there's another security-related bug in Microsoft Windows. So, <clears throat> PGP actually started out as a human rights project. Uh, I was a peace activist in the 1980s. Um, and during the 1980s, uh, the uh, peace groups were kind of in a very adversarial relationship with the White House. Uh, we were accused of being uh, uh, KGB puppets, you know, and and uh, 
uh, offices were, were burglarized by the FBI to uh, get the floppy disk containing their contributors and mailing lists. And I figured back then that there was a need to protect grassroots political organizations uh, from the government. And that, and that uh, in, in other governments around the world, other countries around the world, in oppressive countries, that human rights groups, human rights workers, uh, or just ordinary people that wanted to protect, needed to protect their human rights, needed to have this kind of tool. Um, now, the business, excuse me, the, uh, the threat model that business encryption software had at that time was <coughs> protecting your business secrets from your competitors. But your business competitors don't have any significant cryptanalytic capabilities. You know, 56-bit DES was just fine for that because, you know, some other company wasn't going to break 56-bit DES. They didn't, they weren't going to break it. They weren't going to have a key exhaustion attack on 56-bit DES or any other attack. So, you know, the software of that time in 1991 kind of reflected that. Privacy enhanced mail was uh, used 56-bit DES. Um, but PGP had a different threat model, and that threat model uh, the, nat uh, the national technical means of major governments could be used to attack files that were going to be encrypted with PGP because it was for human rights applications. And in the Cold War, you know, even the smaller countries, the op smaller oppressive countries were sort of client states of the superpowers. And so major governments could be, could be uh, called upon to try to break the, this, this stuff. And so that drove the design of PGP. Now, after PGP was published, the decade after that, which was the decade after the Cold War, the end of the Cold War, the world changed. And um, the, uh, the, the intelligence agencies um, kind of were looking for new things to do after the end of the Cold War. And, and so and their governments uh, kind of reassigned them to new things to do, including uh, economic espionage. And so to compete in a global economy, <coughs> businesses began to have the need to protect their stuff from uh, the same things, the major governments. Uh, so uh, the business population of users started to have the same requirements as the human rights workers. Not exactly. I mean, nobody was going to die if, they, if their stuff was decrypted. But at least it was the same assets attacking it. So PGP uh, became a, a business tool, and now it's you know and now it's a commercial product. But the original purpose was that it was a human rights project. And during the three-year uh, criminal case, uh, my defense lawyers wouldn't allow me to say that it was uh, a human rights project because if I said that, that would be important for the uh, prosecution's case, which they were trying to show intent that I intended it to be exported. And if I said that it was for human rights, that it was a human rights project, that's almost the same as saying that I wanted it to be exported. So I, I wasn't allowed to say that at that time. But you know, the statute of limitations are over, so now I can say that. Um, so you don't take a human rights tool and put a back door on it. You know, people could die. So um, you know, during the uh, the AES conference. Um, uh, there, there were three AES conferences. Brian Snow, who was this senior cryptographer at NSA, uh, got up and said that, that when he listens to companies talk about their attitude toward data security, they always talk about it in terms of liability. They think about liability. How much will I be sued for? How much could I lose financially if I screw up in this encryption stuff? You know. And he said that he never thinks of it that way because, uh, you know, Brian makes stuff that at NSA, you know, that protects um, secrets or, you know, that lives are on the line. He said if, he's, if he makes a mistake, somebody dies. And that's a totally different attitude than thinking of it in terms of liability. Uh, and he said that, um, and he said to me during the break that uh, he really liked my attitude about PGP because I had the same attitude. And so that's what drove PGP, and that's what makes PGP so different from other commercial products that, that do encryption. So anyway, <coughs> um, let's see. 
let me open it up for questions to kind of give me an idea of what you're interested in. Yeah. Um, quantum computers. You know, a lot of people ask about quantum computers. You know, it's very hard to build a, a quantum computer of any size. You have to you have to isolate it from the rest of the universe, and I mean really isolate it. You know, it can't have any kind of quantum mechanical interaction with gravity waves or photons or anything else. It has to be isolated from the rest of the universe, and that's not an easy thing to do. Um, you know, they have uh, built quantum computing devices of just a couple of bits, but there's not anything that can attack, you know, uh, operational cryptog cryptography. You don't have, uh, I, I, th I tend to think of it as a science fiction technology. I'm not going to base my career plans on them building quantum computers. Call me when it works. Yeah. Oh sure, quantum cryptography is not really it doesn't really have anything to do with quantum computing. It's uh, it's it's sending photons through glass fibers, that uh, one photon at a time to, uh, and and you look at it whether it's polarized this way or that way, and and if anybody intercepts it, they're going to change the way it's polarized, and you can tell whether it's been intercepted or not. Uh, it's it's a cool idea, but um, I mean. You know, you could rely on cryptography instead. Uh, it, you can't do it over enormous distances. You know, they do it over a few kilometers of, of fiber optics. Yeah. Well, <coughs> that's a good question. Uh, will encryption always be legal? You know, I think that uh, if we if we just hang on to what we have and not let them take it away, we can do that. You know, right after 9-11, there was a lot of discussion about, are we going to lose the gains that we had fought so hard to win in, in the 1990s? And um, nothing happened, you know? Nobody, uh, nobody tried to make, or I think there was some legislation that was talked about to, uh, you know, to bring back the export controls. <coughs> but it never happened. One reason why it never happened was that uh, John Ashcroft, who I disagree with on, on just about everything, um, was a senator during the debate that we had in the 1990s, and he was on our side of the debate. So, okay, on that one thing, you know, uh, he was on our side, and uh, he seems to have stayed that way when he became Attorney General. And also, you know, the NSA, you know, uh, gave up years ago on this. The FBI didn't. The FBI fought it to the bitter end. But the, well, that's because the FBI doesn't really have any cryptographers working for them. The NSA does. And so the NSA saw the handwriting on the wall years ago and, and kind of woke up and smelled the coffee before any of the other federal agencies. And they knew that they were going to lose it. And they, they fought it for a little while, but they didn't fight it hard because they just knew it was inevitable. I don't think it's going to come back. They, I, somebody told me that the that the new draft of, the, of you know the rather the Patriot Act two had something in it about that, and I haven't seen that. Um, but if it does, then you know we're you know we'll have to fight it again. But remember, it's now entrenched. The whole computer industry exports cryptography all the time. It's not easy to just take that away. They might try to impose some domestic controls, but that's also entrenched. It's, it's a very hard thing for them to do. We don't want to get too complacent, but uh, I don't think that, I don't think we should be too worried about it. If it comes up, we'll fight it. Yeah. Well, um, it wasn't treason. It was actually uh, the charge uh, would have been the uh, violation of the Arms Export Control Act, which is uh, exporting munitions. In other words, if I exported Stinger missiles to Libya, I would be violating the same law and be charged with the same crime for exporting PGP. Um, I, 
I per okay, how I heard about this was uh, I got a call from uh, 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 a, a uh, U.S. Customs agent, uh, Robin Sturzer, called me up on the phone and said, uh, uh, this is Special Agent Robin Sturzer of U.S. Customs. We'd like to ask you some questions about PGP. And I, and I thought that maybe they needed some help on... <laughs> Maybe they'd seized a computer and maybe there were files encrypted with BGP and they wanted my advice, you know. I was going to tell her to call psychic friends. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I was, you know, I was trying to be helpful and answered whatever questions and tried to explain her what PGP was. And then she said she'd like to fly out to Boulder. I lived in Boulder, Colorado at the time, from, from their office in San Jose, send two agents of U.S. Customs, put them on an airplane fly out to Boulder. That's when I realized that there was something going on here that they weren't just looking for a tutorial on PGP. Uh, so I contacted a criminal defense lawyer, Phil Dubois. Um, he's a he's a kind of a streetwise uh, criminal lawyer in Boulder, Colorado. He actually is in Colorado Springs now. But anyway, so I walked into his office and I saw on the floor a box that said, um, uh, discovery documents for Michael Bell, which was he was a he was a murderer, you know, <laughs> and I was so freaked out by this, you know. I thought, oh my God, this guy defends criminals. <laughs> what am I doing here? <laughs> um, <clears throat> so you know, if you're in that situation, you know, you don't go to your family lawyer who, do, who does your will and, and your business advisor, you know. You go to a criminal lawyer. You go to somebody with street smarts, preferably somebody with drug experience, you know. Somebody who's, who's, who, has a lot, who has experience with the feds, you know. Somebody who's had to fight in the trenches. Somebody who's maybe who, who was served in the public defender's office so they know how to do it with minimal resources. Phil Dubois was that kind of lawyer. And um, and so uh, I told him what you know what had happened, and and uh, and so we put together a uh, an appeal for funds for you know legal defense fund, and we got contributors from all over the world sending money in, and I got other lawyers on the legal defense team who volunteered to do it for free. Phil had to be paid because he didn't work for this big law firm like the other lawyers, so he had you know he lived by his wits every day. And so he had to be paid for his work. Um, but the other lawyers were pro bono. And um, I had four lawyers on the core defense team. Um, I had uh, uh, Kurt Carnell in, uh, in San Francisco, who was uh, a former uh, federal prosecutor and, uh, and, and an intellectual property lawyer. At that time, we thought there were intellectual property elements to the case. Uh, Eben Moglin, a Columbia Law School professor who wrote an APL interpreter uh, before he became a lawyer. And he clerked for Thurgood Marshall. Then uh, there was Ken Bass, who was uh, 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 used to be a, a work in the Justice Department on national security matters and worked for a big law firm in, in Washington. And uh, then we had a couple of other, other lawyers that helped out from time to time. But the, the gang of four was who did most of the heavy lifting. And um, it was a great team. And, uh, and, I talk, and I wanted to talk to the press, but they were telling me, don't talk to the press. Because lawyers don't want their clients talking to the press. They never do. And, but I, my instincts told me that if we were going to get through this, I would need the press. So I said, I'm going to talk to the press. After all, the lawyers work for me, you know. And so I talked to the press almost every day for the entire three years, about five times a week. Um, and the press, I think, had a lot to do with why the government dropped the case. Now, I'm sure if you asked the Justice Department that, they would deny that. But I just have a feeling that the press made the political climate difficult for the government to proceed in the case. Every one of the press articles that appeared was sympathetic to me and critical of the government. Not 99 percent, you know, every last one. So. Um, you know that's that's a great asset to have, and and you know and sometimes, um, you know during critical parts of the of the case we knew when the when the uh, when the decision of whether to indict me was going to be handed off from the local prosecutor to Maine Justice in D.C. 
And so at that time, we got the press on the East Coast, the Washington Post, the New York Times, U.S. News and World Report, you know, the, the news magazines, all cranked up to write about me at, during that critical, critical time when policy people in, at, just, at justice were making a decision of whether to proceed. Um, and, and the press was actually, the, the, actually the press was sort of, they, they kind of, you know, tossed all semblance of objectivity out the window. You know, they would say to me during the press interviews, okay, I'm all yours. What do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? <laughs> I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but the press uh, was firmly behind me because this was a First Amendment case. If I can be pr put in prison for publishing something, then, you know, that hits close to home for the press. Uh, there's no way that the press is going to be against me in that case. So, um, so they turned up the heat at just the right time. Um, now, early in the case, it looked really bad because early in the case, well, early in the case, I, you know, I, I was told of this in um, September of, uh, of 93. And in October of 93, I went to Washington to testify in front of Congress in favor of some legislation to get rid of these export controls. So I went to Washington, and while I was in Washington, <coughs> I went to um, EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, where they had assembled a team of lawyers. There were 10 lawyers in the room. They, they were all lawyers, nobody but lawyers, because it was, uh, the, so we could, I could tell them about it, and it would all be a privileged attorney-client communication. Um, and so um, there were people from uh, EFF, there were lawyers from EFF, the Electronic Privacy Information Center, the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, some pri a couple of private law firms in Washington, uh, Phil Dubois, my criminal lawyer, and I don't know, I think, I can't remember all of them. But uh, they all sat and listened to me tell them what the case was. And I had some real vulnerabilities in the case. The biggest vulnerability was not what happened in June of 91 when I published BGP on the internet, but rather what happened later when I helped in the development of PGP 2.0, because then I was actively involved in, uh, in managing the development of a, of, a, of a crypto product overseas. I had, in fact, and it was so much, there was so much uh, audit trail to show that I had an $800 phone bill one month of, because of just talking to the software engineers in New Zealand, in, in, uh, in Amsterdam, in uh, Southern California. Uh, coordinating this handoff of code from continent to continent uh, on a daily basis. And uh, so there was all kinds of proof that I was violating the Arms Export Control Act for that. That's where I thought the vulnerability was, the subsequent development. So I told the lawyers this. They listened to it, and they shook their heads, and they said, there's nothing we can do to help you. You're, you're, you're dead. <laughs> um, I mean, they didn't say it quite as succinctly as that, you know. It wasn't quite as black and white as that. They, they, you know, they said a whole lot of things, but that was the checksum of what they said. Um, and so, you know, the feeling in the pit of my stomach of hearing 10 lawyers all in the same room. I mean, what a concentration of legal skill, all saying that. Phil Dubois was the only criminal lawyer in the room. Phil Dubois was not worried, you know. <laughs> Because when it comes down to it, you know, when it, you know, when it comes in, in the courtroom, you know, he knows what to do. But the other lawyers were, you know, they were, they had other specialties, and they were all saying, "You have no chance," you know. Um, <clears throat> so that was my darkest day. That was the worst day, and it's a good thing that meeting happened after my congressional testimony instead of before, because I would have been a basket case in front of Congress. Um, so we, we, we mounted this de defense effort, effort and uh, it worked, you know. People contributed from all over the world and, and we, we kicked their ass. Uh, um, one of the things that we did was um, uh, we went to MIT, I went to MIT and uh, got them to put it on their FTP site. Actually, I, I, we, I ran into them at a, at a Computers Freedom and Privacy Conference and we kind of came up with the idea at the same time. They would publish the source code in, the, in a book with MIT Press. It was a high-profile, high-prestigious academic press that would publish the source code and, uh, you know, and, and export the books. And that would 
you know, that's a kind of a in-your-face kind of uh, gesture to the government. Um, we took the actual source code, line byte for byte, from uh, PGP 262, which was the current version at that time, and, and put it in a book, and, and tried to put it in a nice, scannable font. <laughs> and then the uh, author's preface to the book, which I have on my website if you want to read it. Go to philzimmerman.com and you can read the preface to this book. Spell Zimmerman the right way with two N's, the German spelling, because there's another guy with Phil, n named Phil Zimmerman, and he's got a website, too. And he spells it with one N. Um, but anyway, in this preface, I said why, this, why we're doing this book, you know, and you could scan this book in in Europe. So um, the, the strategy here was that um, we were going to ask permission to export the book. Uh, we were going to ask the State Department for a commodities jurisdiction. Now, some of you may have been at the Black Hat Conference. How many people here saw my talk at the Black Hat Conference? Okay, so you, some of you have heard this already. But we, um, I, and I apologize for repeating myself for that. But the, the reason why we were going to do this was because um, Phil Karn um, had taken Bruce Schneier's book, Applied Cryptography, and applied for a, a CJ, a commodities jurisdiction for that book. And, 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 of course, they gave it to him because there's nothing wrong with exporting books. And they laughed you know, why are you asking us such a stupid question? Of course you can export this book. Don't bother us with silly things like this. We don't have any export controls on books. And so then he then applied for a commodities jurisdiction for a floppy disk containing the source code that was in the book. And so they freaked out, you know. They, they, they realized that they'd been had. And, and, um, and, and he said, well, you said yes to the book, well, here's a floppy disk with the book on it. In fact, it's not even the whole book. It's just the appendices with the source code, you know. <laughs> How could you object to that? And, of course, they said no. And so then he appealed it. There's administrative appeals you can do. And they kept saying no, 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 because the NSA said no, no, no. The NSA told the State Department. I had later, years later, I did a, a FOIA lawsuit, and I got some documents from the State Department, from NSA, from other agencies. And you can see the conversation going on between NSA and the State Department about these books. And, um, and so um, he sued them. And so the State Department was actually uh, defendants in a lawsuit uh, at the time that they got the commodities jurisdiction application from MIT Press for my book. And also, they'd already been suckered once. They knew what was going to follow if they said yes to that book. So. Um, they never said anything. They didn't say yes. They didn't say no. They just sat on it. And um, but MIT Press didn't wait. They just exported the book immediately. So it was already. And besides, you know, the software was already available in Europe, which was we didn't actually do the book with MIT Press because we wanted to export the source code. The, exp the source code was already exported. We did it because it was part of our defense strategy. We wanted to use it at trial. And then years later, we did another book with the source code after I started a company. And the purpose of that book was really to export source code. And we came up with these special tools for scanning the book. We had checksums on every line. Uh, we had OCRB font. We had modified the OCR font to uh, make some of the characters less ambiguous. And we were able to scan it in um, tremendously fast. And so uh, I, even had, I even had a book with all the software tools that we developed. The name of this book was Tools for Publishing Source Code via OCR. <laughs> and uh, it, it's, it was really slick. But it blew a hole a mile wide in the export regime of the Clinton administration. And, uh, and they just realized how futile it was. And that had a lot to do with them of, of breaking down their will to fight. And eventually, along with you know, the rest of the computer industry is putting pressure on them too, they gave up and they dropped the export controls. We had a multi-front war going on. We had uh, litigation going on in the courts. We had the Congress acting to try to turn it around. And the executive branch decided that they weren't going to be flanked by the courts and, and Congress, the other two branches of government, so they just made an executive decision to lift the export controls. So that's how we won that battle, and I don't think we're going to... I don't think we're going to have to fight it again. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, a lot of people recognized that it was silly. But the FBI didn't. The FBI hung on to it. They, you know, this is not a black and white issue. I mean, they're certainly, you know, they had their points. You know, criminals do use this. Terrorists do use this. Al Qaeda uses PGP. Um, you know, I'm sorry that that's the case, but that's the, you know, that's the trade-off we make. You know, either we have nobody have crypto, or we have everybody have crypto. And and I think that the world is better off if if we have strong crypto. You know, the internet works a lot better. And and as we move our lives from from the physical analog world to the digital world, we we need crypto to, uh, to 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 enjoy the same protections we had in the analog world. We had envelopes for postal mail. Why can't we have envelopes for digital mail? You know. So, um, you know, we have financial transactions, we have medical records, we need, you know, the case was clear that we needed this, but it, but it, but it wasn't, you know, it, but there were arguments to be made on the other side, and that's why it took so many years. We fought this, this, um, this debate for, for years uh, in, the, you know, in the courts, in, in academia, in, in uh, the, you know, journalists, uh, uh, Congress. Okay, sure. Um, the FBI, the NSA, the press, everybody participated in this debate. And there was a lot of expert participation from all these quarters, a lot of uh, legal scholars. Uh, everybody was involved. And it took years, and we came to a decision collectively that we should get rid of the export controls, that we should not have domestic controls. And I think it was a good decision. And, and uh, to try to turn that decision back in the the uh, in the, the sort of heat of the moment after 9/11 would have been a tragic mistake. Pardon me. Oh, you mean um, the question is? I think you're asking about the, that that maybe the courts could force you to give up your private key. Yeah, that's something that I that I I think we're probably going to see some effort to do that here, and I, I think that um, that's going to be a, a, a you know a fight that we're going to have to make. Um, the um, there's for, there's um, there's Fifth Amendment problems with that with self-incrimination. Uh, there's also um, there's also the idea that uh, what are they going to do if you forget your your passphrase, you know, in the, in the stress of being a criminal defendant, uh, it could happen. Um, now maybe it wouldn't happen for something you're using every day, but but you know, uh, not everybody uses the same passphrase all the time for all their crypto needs. I mean, I actually have some PGP disk volumes that from years ago that I I got creative and used different passphrases for those. What a stupid thing, you know? Because <laughs> I forgot what they were. And now, for the life of me, I can't read. I don't even remember what's in them anymore, you know? It's, it's like been five years. I can't open those, and, and I, I, you know, I, I guess I should throw them away. <laughs> yeah. Give them to the NSA, yeah. I was thinking of what you could do for that is, is if you want to find out if the NSA can break PGP, is you, you hire a comedian to write a really, really funny joke and not tell it to anyone else. Commission them, you know, to do this. And you encrypt it with PGP. And then you, you know, put it out somewhere in a channel that, you know, you know they're going to intercept, and hope that they intercept it. Try to make, try to convince them that they ought to intercept it and break it. And, and then wait for several years and see if the joke shows up in the population. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, denial and encryption. The problem with that is that the message size is is limited by how much information is in the message. You know, if you're going to put two messages in there, it's going to be twice as big. So it's hard to do that. I mean, you could do that if you had one-time pads, because then you have, the, you know, you got this one-time pad will turn it into the real message, and this other one-time pad will turn it into, you know, uh, the Simpsons. You know, 
or whatever. So uh, you could do it that way, but nobody uses one-time pads. And if you started using them, then they would they would know what you, why you were doing it. You know. <laughs> Yeah, steganography, you mean? Yeah. Well, you know, the problem with steganography is that it, it works okay for once in a while when somebody is trapped behind enemy lines and they've got to get this one message out to, to get picked up by the helicopters, you know. That's fine, but you can't have 100 million people do it every day because it depends on the enemy not knowing you're doing it. You know, I had a guy call me up. People actually call me up about this. They don't just write to me. They call me up. And it was early in the morning. I think he was on the East Coast. And, and he said that he had this cool idea of hiding information in a picture, you know. And I said, well, congratulations, you've just reinvented steganography. <laughs> and he said he thought it was such a cool idea that he wanted to create a standard. He wanted to propose a standard by the standards bodies in, for this. And I thought, oh, this is great. You know, this is like Samsonite luggage having a standardized compartment for smuggling cocaine, <laughs> you know. Every suitcase would have it in the lower left corner, you know. A lot of advantages in adhering to standards. Yeah. Um. Well, there's a lot of there's several implementations of the Open PGP standard. Um, GNU Privacy Guard is an open source version, uh, and it doesn't have any patented algorithms in it. Uh, I, I applaud that. I, I unfortunately did use patented algorithms in the original PGP, and um, in fact, it doesn't use the Idea Cipher because they have a patent on that. The Idea Cipher is a really good cipher, but I stopped using it because it because it had this patent. And they did too. Actually, we still have it in there for legacy reasons. But uh, Hush Hushmail or Hush Communications has a product, a web-based email encryption service called, called Hushmail, that is Open PGP compliant. It's really nice. Uh, it doesn't work on a Macintosh for some reason, but and I use a Mac, so I can't really use it that much. But it's really nice on on browsers that support it like on the PC. Uh, there's another company up in Seattle called uh, Athora. Uh, they were. Um, they also have a web-based encrypted email service. I have until 12, right? 10 minutes. Okay. Um, and uh, and then there's uh, Veritas in Belgium, which has uh, uh, several Open PGP compliant products, including a, a, a Unix command line product. Now. Network Associates, when they sold the intellectual property of PGP to um, PGP Corp, they retained the uh, command line version for some period of time. So PGP can't sell that. This is not interesting enough, I see. <laughs> better, I'd better try to get interesting in the last 10 minutes or I'm going to lose the audience. Yeah. What? Why would there be a risk if it's open standards? Well, somebody could implement their own version that has a backdoor, and you know, I encourage people to publish the source code of their implementation. So, I would recommend that that you uh, only use products that publish their source code. Network Associates doesn't publish their source code anymore. Um, yeah. Oh, the Washington Post story. I, I got this interview from this reporter who, who talked to me just a few days after 9-11. And, uh, and uh, you know, we were talking about how upset we all were about what happened, you know. And, uh, and, and I, I told her that, uh, you know, that I had, I thought about, the, you know, this whole question of cryptography and terrorism and all that. Uh, and it, but I decided that it, you know that it was still the right thing to do to publish to strong cryptography. Um, but th that also, but I was also um, you know that I had that I had cr cried about it like everybody else. You know, uh, 
But for some reason, um, it got changed by her editors. And it, it was shortened. The, the article was shortened. She read it to me over the phone before she ran it because I wanted to make sure she didn't say something that was politically damaging, you know? Like, if she's, I wanted to make sure that she was clear that I still felt that PGP was a good thing to do. And she read it to me on the phone, and she said that, and it was all perfect. And then she gave it to her editors. And the editors shortened the article. And they took some of my remarks and just shortened them to, yeah, I don't know what they, they didn't shorten the remarks, they just threw them out. Threw them out. And they said that, 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 I, that I felt guilty about, that I regretted writing PGP. And uh, this was like completely wrong. She didn't write that, I didn't say that, and I made her say that to me over the phone, you know, to make sure that she didn't say that. So I had to issue a denial, which caused thousands of emails to the Washington Post. It was a shitstorm they never experienced. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, it, it damaged her career, you know. It, it, it almost, uh, uh, it got her in trouble with her editors, uh, which, I, which seems backwards to me because they're the ones that did it, you know. And, uh, and so, and then I had to write another thing saying it wasn't her fault, you know. She read it to me and it was right, you know, <laughs> before she published it. So, um, you know, so I, had, so I had to write something about, you know, that why it was a good idea to have strong cryptography and to deny that. It's, that's on my website, too, by the way. Yeah. Rocket engines? What do you mean? Yeah, uh, Homeland Security Act has restricted several different classes of rocket engines because oh. they contain things that can make them into a bad thing. And right now yeah. in the rocket, hobby, rocket industry, it's a it's really industry okay. So Homeland Security won't allow people to use rocket engines because they might yeah. turn them into missiles. Yeah. You have to be licensed. Yeah. Uh, I don't know anything about that. Okay. What I'm saying is it seems that there's other inroads elsewhere. Do you think this is a concerted effort where they just... There's constant pressure to, uh, to uh, maintain our, our civil liberties against uh, people that want to respond to, you know, national security threats and take them away. We have to always be vigilant. We're never, we can never relax, you know. So I guess we must be out of time because everybody's leaving. <laughs>
<laughs> so I used, a, I used a block cipher, I used the idea cipher, which was a far better cipher. And at that time, even though there was a patent on it, I did get permission to use the patent. Um, so, yeah. It's ease of use. The reason why people haven't adopted PGP is ease of use. A couple years back, somebody at Carnegie Mellon, I think it was, or somewhere, wrote a, a paper called uh, Why Johnny Can't Encrypt. <laughs> and it was about the difficulty of grasping all this, these concepts of public key, trust models, infra public key infrastructure, and all that. Your mom can't use PGP. Doesn't matter whether it's got a GUI on it or not. It's not just PGP, it's all the others too, all the other in in public key encryption products. This whole idea of certifying keys and all that, it's just something that your mom is not gonna get. And so we had to come up with something that didn't require you to grasp all that. And now PGP Corporation has a new product that's coming out very soon that lets everybody in an enterprise, you know, thousands of employees in an office, in an office building, all encrypt their email without even realizing it. So not only do they not have to be trained, but they don't even have to know what's happening. And so it's a, it's a proxy, it's an email proxy. And uh, all the email going in the building and all the email going out of the building gets encrypted and decrypted on the fly. So that, you know, that lets the great unwashed masses who are, who are who's never gonna try to learn this stuff get their email encrypted. Meanwhile, the power users, the geeks, can still do everything they always did before and manage it on their desktop with the clients running PGP, just like they did before. So everybody gets what they want, you know? So it's a cool product, and a lot of big companies are really uh, responding well to it. So I, I recommend if you work for a company, you take a look at this new product coming out from PGP. Johnny can encrypt, can, can encrypt with that. Yeah. Yeah, except it's for email, you know. I think we're done. Okay. <laughs>